Hi, everybody. Welcome to our live stream tonight. We are live, and just to prove that we're live, watch this. <laughs> now I'm showing off. <laughs> um, I uh, want to thank all of you for joining us tonight. I'm with Jason Dudley. Jason, thanks for, for being here. Thanks for uh, joining this class. Jason is um, a uh, adjunct professor for us in the Department of Marketing. He is also a former MS Marketing student of mine and a uh, fellow innovation um, crazy man like me. He teaches the SIT course uh, for us, and he is now uh, at a uh, consumer packaged goods company located in Cincinnati. <laughs> Jason, uh, can you just briefly introduce yourself and tell us what you're doing at, at uh, Proctor? Yeah. yeah, Jason Dudley, I'm allowed to say, I think, uh, P&G. And oddly enough, I now find myself as the, uh, the Director of Innovation for Gain Laundry and Fabric Enhancers, but it feels <laughs> like yesterday that it was uh, the day before my last exam with Drew, so I had a great time in this course, I think it was eye-opening for me to see that innovation was something that um, could be taught. I always thought it was something you were born with and had the opportunity through my capstone to work with uh, Oil Belay, then again with Imes, and then I've been doing the same trick over and over again through my career. So enjoy practicing it, enjoy teaching it. I always find I uh, learn something new and happy to be here. I always say it, but feel free to those people graduating, graduating in a few years, reach out with any questions because it uh, really does feel like yesterday. So it's been a fun journey. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to just tag team tonight. We don't really um, have a formal script per se because we both know this method so well. And we just thought it would be uh, valuable for us to uh, do this review. We're live streaming it because I am um, interested in learning more about what live streaming can offer. Um, talking to the University of Cincinnati about it. And this live stream is being done in conjunction with two courses that, that uh, are being taught at the, at the Lindner College of Business right now. Uh, the graduate MKTG 7014 as well as the undergraduate MKTG 4014. And our goal tonight is to just um, review the SIT method in detail and allow, allow you to ask questions and really get you prepped for the final exam. We've had good experience with the final exam. I don't ex anticipate any of you um, struggling with it or having any problems with it, but I think the review is good for you just in the sense that it, it helps to kind of crystallize and clarify things that, that may have... Um, um, you may not have grasped during the course or have forgotten or anything else. Uh, I would would like to ask you if you could, though, before we get started, uh, if you're so inclined, go ahead and subscribe to this channel. You don't have to stay subscribed to it, but if you hit subscribe and if you hit the like button, that's also, I guess, the good thing to do. <laughs> so do me a favor and hit the, uh, the like button. I am um, really happy to see the turnout tonight. We have uh, about 65 joining us now. Chris Allen, uh, Christopher, good to see you. Tyler, okay, um, really good turnout. So hit subscribe and hit that little like button. And what we'll do is review tonight, <clears throat> Jason and I, back and forth, just kind of chime in on each of these techniques uh, to make sure that, you know, you're really feeling good about it. <clears throat> um, and... What uh, we want to remember is that SIT is a structured method based on patterns. It's a method based on patterns that have been used by mankind for thousands of years. Uh, innovators have used these patterns many times without even realizing it. And these patterns are now embedded into the products and services you see around you every day. Think of these patterns almost as the DNA of a product or service. And what these patterns do is help guide your thinking. They channel your ideation for you. Um, and this, <clears throat> this is such an important uh, contribution to creative thinking because essentially you're using the wisdom of creative people, everyday innovators. And, and what's interesting is that you don't have to look too far to know that many, many, many people 
um, have used patterns in their creative work, creative people like the Beatles, creative uh, artists like Salvador Dali or Pablo Picasso have used patterns. Authors use patterns, artists, um, <clears throat> poets. But it's not just creative people like songwriters, it's other uh, people like inventors. They have patterns that help boost their creative output. And what's true is that you have learned this method now as a way to boost your creative output, no matter where you're starting from in the creativity scale. Uh, and that's the real gift, I think, of SIT. <clears throat> and my, my plea to all of you in, in these courses has been to see this as a way to boost your, your creative output and boost your, your career potential. Um, I've told all of you that I want you to learn this method to the point where you can walk into an employer and say, I've been trained on how to innovate. I know how to create new products and services for your company. Now, that seems like a tall claim, but if you've learned this method, if you've applied this method and you practice and continue to develop it, you will be that, uh, you'll have that ability to make that claim for, for sure. Uh, all you have to do is look at Jason. You know, Jason's not the only one, too. I've had many, many students that have gone on to very successful careers and carry forward using this method in their in their work. So yeah, there's a lot of upside for you. That one is, um, yep. It's just it's the proof is in the pudding with this method, right? So I think what's hard about a lot of creativity methods is you come in and it's very abstract, it's ambiguous, it's soft. Um, I'll never forget after I'd finished my capstone, you walked in to a group of, I think, seven to 10 senior, I don't know if you remember this moment, senior PNG engineers with probably like 120 years between them. And young in my career, I had never seen somebody come so hot into a meeting, not Drew, but this engineer, he stands up and he goes, I don't know why I should be here. This is like the 40th time I've done an innovation session. And Drew calmly said, well, Let's see if it works. And he led the guy through a live exercise, um, picked a tool, they worked it together. And then there he had his attention, right? So I think when I first learned this method, it was like, there's something too good to be true here. And what's great is it's not, right? It's a fixed formula that you can follow. Um, it's not snake oil, it's nothing magical. It's just a method that's tried and true over time. So Drew mentioned it, but I've gone to, um, seven different assignments, three different companies and used it every time. And even use the little things in between, whether it's brainstorming, right? And, and how to better brainstorm and not brainstorm for that matter, <clears throat> share those articles. So I really would encourage y'all to um, take it with you, whether, whether you're teaching it or you're just coming up with ideas on your own. Every time I start an assignment, six months in, I go, oh shit, it's time to pull out the SIT book again and, and get down <laughs> and practice what I preach. So, <clears throat> I know that's a long plug, but uh, I can't say enough for it. Yeah, great. Good. Okay, so let's get into the review. Uh, I am going to uh, share my screen every so often, uh, but let's go ahead and, and um, first of all, I encourage you to ask questions in the, in the chat. You're certainly welcome to and invited to ask us questions later uh, by email or by phone or by text. I'm happy, we're happy to jump on a, a Zoom call with you at any point, just to make sure you're solid on this. The final exam has been posted, and you will um, see that the final exam basically is a way for you to pick a product category and apply the SIT method to that particular category. And I'd like you to pick something that's relevant to you, either in your current work or maybe an interview that you've got coming up or you aspire to. Why not use this final exam as a way to generate new to the world ideas like a portfolio that you could walk into a potential employer and say, I did this as part of my schoolwork. I think that'd be pretty impressive. So I'm going to let you pick. If you have questions about what you're picking, though, feel free to ask me because there are certain things that I'm going to want you to stay away from. You should stay away from any product that you really don't understand the, the mechanism of how it works. For example, if you don't understand microwave ovens, do not pick a microwave oven. Uh, be sure that you pick something that is within your wheelhouse of knowledge um, that you know or can look up, but that you, you, know, you really do have an understanding of, of its components. 
If you know SIT by now, you should know that it's basically a method that takes the components and attributes of a product or service, rearranges them or manipulates them in some way to produce something new that gives you a chance to see new value that wasn't there. So complete the final exam, uh, and what you'll do then is submit that. We will grade the final exams essentially on five things. Uh, did you create something that's truly new to the world? Did you create something that is useful? Did you create something that's viable? Did you create, did you use the tool correctly? And did you pick something that is, has closed world thinking within it? Meaning you are inside the box. You didn't have to go out and export something into the scenario to, to make this work. Uh, that's what you'll be judged on those five aspects. So let's go through and do a review of each of the techniques and the principles. Let's cover the principles first. And Jason, I'll start and you, you uh, will go ping pong here and um, keep an eye on questions as you have them. I think the, the first principle that you uh, want to keep in mind here is the principle of fixedness. Fixedness is that cognitive bias that makes it very difficult for us to imagine things other than what we know. And there's three types of fixedness. Functional fixedness, right? Functional fixedness makes it very hard for us to imagine a component having a different function than what we know. And functional fixedness is so prevalent largely because of the, the names we give things. You know, we give something a name, and now it has that label, and it's hard for us to imagine that, that component, that thing doing something, because, just because of the words we've assigned to it. We've, we've created fixedness for ourselves, so to speak. Structural fixedness, it's very hard for us to imagine a, a, something having a different structure than what we're used to. Structures are all around us, and in, in policies, in organizational structures, um, road signs, how something is built. A chair, for example, has four legs. Well, that's, that's structural fixedness. And, and, <clears throat> and again, it's based on our world knowledge, how we understand the world. And the third type of fixedness is called relational fixedness. Relational fixedness means it's very hard for us to imagine two attributes in the environment having a relationship that wasn't there or not having a relationship that is there. So SIT is really geared to breaking fixedness. And a secret to using SIT successfully is to kind of know that fixedness is around the corner. In fact, the sooner you can find the fixedness, the more likely you are to build an idea. You're actually looking for your fixedness. You can't get rid of it. Not at all. In fact, you want to find it because on the other side of fixedness is what? It's a good idea. That's the, that's the real beauty of um, the SIT method with fixedness. Jason, any, any follow-up, any comment? Yeah, what I'd add is for me, fixedness, when I sit down to look at a product, looks like playing back all the ideas I've had to date or little ideas I've heard from others. And instead of, I think when I first took this course, I'd try to take a great idea I'd had and back it into SIT. I'd say, oh, I've got this good idea. I can figure out how it fits with SIT versus truly saying, all right, I've got that idea. Let me table it. And then at random, pick a new idea. That's what I love about this methodology is it lets you create randomness, which leads to new things. So would encourage you that um, when you start thinking of the same ideas, that's normal. That's how everybody's brain works, right? Lean into the method to create some randomness and bring in those new ideas. The next principle is the principle of function follows form. Function follows form is this cognitive process that happens inside your head. Function follows form is this idea that you, you don't innovate necessarily from the product to the solution, from the problem to the solution, that in fact you can go from a solution, a hypothetical solution, and work backwards to the problem that it solves. And if you recall, humans are actually better at that than the other direction we're actually more facile at going from configurations back to its benefit. 
And many of you should remember the exercise, right? Let's imagine I'm holding a, not a Smoothie King, <laughs> but a baby's milk bottle. What if I said this is a baby's milk bottle, but it changes color when the temperature of the milk changes? And instantly you should say, oh, that's great. That would make sure you don't burn a baby with milk that's too hot. And anywhere, any audience, anywhere in the world that I've spoken, everybody immediately sees that association within, within mere seconds, fractions of seconds. But if I had said, hey, we need a way to come up with, uh, come up with a way on how not to burn a baby with milk that's too hot, how long would it take you to come up with color-changing milk bottle? You would agree that it would take you a lot longer. So the principle of function follows form captures this idea. I'm going to try to bring it up here on my on my screen if I can figure out how. Um, let's see if I can figure it out. What do you, uh, Jason? What do you see now? Oh, here we go. Okay, Microsoft PowerPoint. Perfect. So you see uh, function follows form now. Okay, good. So let's review it because this is the heart of the method. You take an existing situation and you define the closed world. I'm going to talk about that next. That, that closed world is the box that you draw around your usage situation. And that's so important because that's your limitation. That's your constraint, right? That's your boundary. And then you apply the thinking tool one at a time. When you apply that thinking tool, it changes it. It morphs it into something that doesn't look recognizable, will, will seem silly at first. In your final exams, you're going to want to write down that virtual product. You're going to give it a name, kind of define it and visualize it, right? Color-changing milk bottle, screenless TV. Um, and, and then... You ask yourself two questions, but always in this order, never the other way around. The first question you ask yourself is, should we do it? Is there a benefit to this thing? Who would want a color-changing milk bottle in what situations? We call that the market filter. If we find a benefit, and only if we find a benefit, do we go to the second question, which is, can we do it? Is it feasible? Do we have the know-how? Do we have the material? Um, are there technical barriers or regulatory or legal barriers? It's kind of the, the, the implementation filter. If you can't figure out a way to do it, psh, throw it out. Don't waste any more time on it. Go back and roll the dice again and come up with a different virtual product. You allow yourself some adaptations, some iteratively thinking, well, what can, it, what can improve this? You do this systematically, and then you end up with what I would consider an idea. Only then would I consider it an idea. Function follows form. <clears throat> now, I mentioned this idea of the closed world, and this is a uh, an essential. What? There we go. An essential principle, the third principle. And um, let me go ahead and read it and then talk about it. And I want to hear kind of Jason's perspective, too, how he thinks about closed world, especially in a practical situation. What the closed world principle says simply is this. When solving a problem or creating a new solution, one should strive to use only those resources that exist in the product or system itself or in its immediate vicinity. What that is saying is this. The further away you have to go to get a solution to your problem, the less creative it's going to be. The closer your solution is in proximity to your problem, the more creative it's going to be. There's an inverse relationship between the proximity of a problem to so its solution and its level of creativity. And all the closed world is, is a, an imaginary boundary, like a zone around your usage situation. You get, to, you get to define it. But when you do, a very special thing happens. That 
that becomes your working area, your boundary. It's going to dictate all the all the uh, components when you use the techniques. It's going to dictate the attributes when using attribute dependency. Jason, what's what's been some of your experiences with closed world thinking, defining it, challenges with it? Yeah, I'd say when I started, and to some extent for a lot of people now, what I see is they define innovation as taking the fanciest new thing from a company that does innovation and importing it, spending a bunch of money, incorporating the product, and that's innovation. But to your point, that's not where truly creative breakthrough ideas come from, right? Anybody can build, well, not anybody, but a lot of people can build an excellent supply chain. They can have a great purchasing power, but those true ideas that break through are the simplest oftentimes, right? They're simple and they're right in front of you. It's finding a third way to use resources that you already have. And that becomes your competitive advantage, right? That the things that are right in front of you and your competitors, you're using in a different way to create value. Um, so that's been mine. And I, I would encourage you as you guys have these products back to the process, sit with them for a minute. Not every um, virtual product will go somewhere, but sometimes it takes more than five seconds to identify a good use. And I think you saw in the message boards, I encouraged a lot, think of it from every angle, from the consumer's angle, from your company's angle, from the customers you serve, like Walmart, Target, how might it help people? And lean in, to Drew's point, be willing to be a little goofy, laugh. I mean, my favorite part of these courses and working sessions is you start laughing, it gets a little zany, some of these ideas, but usually that laughter is a sign that you're on to something. So my two cents um, on that one is, is you got to think sometimes a little differently, break fixing this that you had, and that often means looking inside and approaching something from uh, a different direction. Yeah, great, good. Um... You know, I, your your point about laughter is so so true because laughter really is a if you think about it, humor is the exact same process as um, innovation. It's the all creativity is is the is the sudden juxtaposition of two previously unrelated themes, um, and laughter is when that 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 crossover happens, that juxtaposition of two things. And if it makes you laugh, you should take note of that as, as something magical has happened here. Um, okay, now, why don't we go through with those three principles in mind, right? So we have the principle of fixedness, principle of function follows form, and the closed world principle. Let's go through and review each of the five techniques uh, feel free to post questions in the in the chat if you've got them. And I'm going to go back to my uh, camera here. And so the first principle is subtraction. Subtraction is defined as the removal of a core element rather than the addition of new systems or functions. Subtraction is a... A uh, very powerful technique because it helps you break underlying assumptions. It helps you break fixedness. To use subtraction, here are the steps. You're going to list the internal components, meaning those components in your closed world directly attached to the product or service. And then remove one, and preferably an essential one. You know, grab something that you think has got to be there. That's going to give you your best chance of really breaking fixedness. And that's where you visualize the virtual product and say, okay, I've got everything left, just not this one component. I have all the remaining components. And with those remaining components, you simply ask, well, what would be the benefit? If you take a component out, typically you have a cost benefit, but not always. You might save some cost. You might this, that, the other thing. But, but really start to look at it, what I find is that you say, if that component's not there, what did it do that I no longer have to worry about? You'll, you'll see some new benefit emerge that, my God, you just couldn't, couldn't believe was there. With subtraction, you ask yourself, can we do it? And if necessary, you don't have to, but if necessary, you can replace that function, but not with the original component, with something from what's called the closed world. 
from the closed world. Yeah, from something in the immediate vicinity. Jason put it well, like, you know, right under your nose, right within your reach. And then you modify the new product to improve it. Uh, the hard part with subtraction is getting um, getting concerned about removing something essential. Uh, you got to you got to take a risk. Um, there's, as Jason said, if you don't find a good virtual product right away, you don't see any benefits. So what? No harm, no foul. Go out and and try it again. Just roll the dice and come up with um, uh, a, a new configuration to consider. When you think about replacements, <clears throat> here again, you want to try to re realize that fixedness is going to be at play, meaning you will have a tendency to look around and um, overlook things that could be very creative if you were able to recruit them to be able to do this, this new work, this new job. Okay, any, any questions about subtraction? Any comments? I think the only build I would have is um, make sure to take away things you think are important or add value. The natural inclination on this one is take away the thing that sounds great. So if I could tell you the amount of times I've heard or read from students, and this is normal, I did it too. Oh, I'm going to take away the wires on the headphones. That's subtraction, right? So lean in. Everybody wants to take away the wires, right? Nobody's going out and saying, for the most part, I really want to wire it now. I think there were jokes about AirPods and putting wires back on so that uh, maybe you wouldn't lose them. But lean into the things that you think are critical, and that's how you're going to break fix it best. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, good. Let's go to the next technique because uh, I want to. I had planned about we had planned about an hour for this. We're at six thirty now, so uh, let's go ahead and, and cover these other four. The next technique is task unification. Task unification is defined as assigning an additional job to an existing resource. Assigning an additional job to an existing resource. A component has its original job. Uh, <clears throat> and I see, yeah, good question. Her question is, can you give examples with the principles? We will. We will give examples of the principles for sure. Task unification is assigning an additional job to an existing resource. Uh, task unification is a tool that forces you to, let me get it up here, to break functional fixedness. We start by listing the internal and external components. Internal means the things attached to the product or service, and external are things right within your reach in the closed world but not necessarily under your control. And we'll, we'll, we'll show you some examples of that in a minute. You assign an additional task to a component. Now there are two ways to do that. One way is just to say this component steals the job of that component. <clears throat> component six now has the job of component 12. Again, I like to pick these things randomly if you don't do it randomly, you're likely to succumb to fixedness, right? If you find yourself running your eyeballs over the lists of components, chances are you're going to go, oh, that can't work. Oh, that can't work. <laughs> so that's one way. Component A steals the job of component B. The other way is to say this component now has the additional job, something related to the customer perhaps making the customer's experience with the product better, making them more informed, making them um, get some other benefit related to the product's use. So if it's riding a bicycle, maybe it's giving them directions or keeping them safe or uh, helping them um, avoid traffic or some, some other benefit related to the, the bike riding. And the key to using task unification is that when you assign an additional job to something, keep in mind that that component is supposed to keep its old job. It doesn't just change jobs. It doesn't get rid of its old job and pick up a new job. Generally, when you do that, you end up with ideas that are maybe not 
that creative, but what I would call resourceful ideas, the, the so-called MacGyver ideas. Um, MacGyver was great at taking something and using it for some new use. Well, that's resourceful. It's not pure play task unification. Um, pure play task unification is when the component does its existing job as well. So, um, uh, Ice McCoy, you know, your comment about an example would be in the rear window of your car, you will find thin wires running through the rear window. And you should know that those wires are there for a day like today where it's icy and snowy. And they help defrost the rear window. But in many cars, guess what else it does? It's also the antenna for many cars. Uh, so it's a, it's a powerful way to get new value out of something. Uh, let me show you some examples. You should remember these from your presentations. Um, so if you look at something like this, this product here, a baby's pacifier, now it not only pacifies the baby, but it keeps its temperature. Classic example of, of a task unification. Um, we use task unification a lot in marketing communications. The park bench not only seats people, but it also communicates brand value. Uh, now, task unification goes nicely with subtraction. If you think about subtraction, subtraction is essentially a replacement. Uh, it's essentially, I'm sorry, essentially a replacement, Right? Once you've removed and subtracted a component, you could think of the replacement as a ta version of task unification. I like to keep them separate, but they do have a close relationship. All right. Um, Jason, any comments about task unification? Any examples top of mind? I like this one. These are always the clever ones, right? I think people recall CAPTCHA as an example, right? Where you were trying to sort out bots and uh, now it's transcribed, I don't even know, like hundreds and hundreds of years in newspapers and uh, books. So I, these are always the fun ones, and it's a great example of closed world where you're getting more with the same stuff you have. Yep. Oh, I think I just knocked it out there. There you go. Okay. Any questions about that? Go ahead and post it into the chat. Go ahead and post it. Let's go on to our next technique. Next technique I want to cover is the uh, multiplication technique. All right, multiplication is defined as the copying an element but changing it in some counterintuitive qualitative way. Multiplication, you change it in some sort of counterintuitive qualitative way. Uh, let me bring up the steps of multiplication here. In multiplication, you start again by listing the components of your closed world. You take one of those components randomly. You make a copy of it. But when you copy it, the biggest mistake students make on this exam is, is on this tool is forgetting to change the copy in some way. How do you change it? It's really up to you, but do it randomly. You can change the material. You can change the location, you can change its function, you can change uh, anything about it, really, as long as you do that sort of randomly without, without anything fixed in mind. I like to take it, copy it, and then just imagine it does something different. That becomes the virtual product. Should we do it? Can we do it? Function follows form. Okay, we're getting a couple questions here, so I want to... Um, just make sure, okay, Gopit, um, Gopinath, okay, in task unification, can we introduce a product to do a job? When you say introduce a product to do a job, that's not really task unification. Task unification is when you take a component of the product and force it to do an additional job. Um, what you're doing, introducing a product, is is a generalized version of, t of function follows form, 
but not pure play SIT. And then um, a question here from Martin. CAPTCHA was mind blowing to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks for bringing that up, uh, Jason. CAPTCHA was a great example. CAPTCHA, if you don't know, CAPTCHA is that thing that forces you to enter in um, information to verify you're a human. If you're on a website, it'll say something like, um, you know, type in these letters. And, um, and what it's doing is it's, it's not only validating you that you're in fact not a, a bot, that you're a human, but it's also a, a, a way to decode um, text, uh, textbooks and things like that that have been optically characterly uh, put through an optical character scanner, an OCR. And, um, and, and so it's doing double duty. It's validating you as a human, but also decoding uh, written text material. So a question from Eli here. Can you give examples of one of these tools in, in a service-based industry? Yeah, great, Eli. So let's talk about subtraction and task unification and multiplication so far in services. You know, in subtraction, task, um, service innovation with subtraction is very viable. Services, remember, a service and a product are identical in that they, they are both benefit delivery vehicles. They can both be written out into components. So take the service of a, a depositing a check at a bank. What are the steps of the service? Well, it depends on how you define the closed world, but you would say depositing a check would be you know, going to the bank, endorsing it, standing in line at the counter, uh, giving the check over to the teller. The teller takes it, verifies your account, enters the money in, and gives you a receipt, and you leave the bank. Okay, something like that. I would make out a l numbered list of those steps of the service. And then imagine pulling one out. You don't fill out a deposit slip anymore. Um, and in fact, if you look at bank services, a lot of them have, <laughs> have innovated by removing some of those key elements. Task unification has many applications in the service industry. If you take a service, uh, I, I think about hotels or I, I look at any service in the airline. M what service innovation there is taking a step of the service and forcing it to do additional jobs, additional work. A service is involves m many times people, um, resources, um, information, it, it has components around it, that service. And now it's giving you um, an opportunity to recruit that component for additional work. I want you to realize that the application of all five of these techniques works the exact same way on services as it does processes. Okay, so um, modern day lifestyle. Uh, so the temperature, so question, so the temperature on the baby sucker was a component taken from the closed world. So that's a great question. Um, if we go to that example with the baby's pacifier, you know, truthfully, that temperature thermometer, you know, you could say, where was it really in the closed world? What you might say is that in that case, you know, there was a baby's thermometer close by. You, you know, you could say that, right? You could say in babies, the, define the closed world as a sick baby or, you know, a baby that, that is um, in, a, in a nursery or in a, in a particular situation. So you could say that that traditional thermometer was in the closed world. But I could also see where you were thinking maybe that thermometer, that temperature was ex was imported from outside the closed world. Okay, you know, it's still I'm I'm not saying you should never go outside the closed world. I never said that. What I am saying is that when you have a tendency to use things in the closed world, they tend to be more creative. If you have to export something in to make it work, that's fine. So uh, very nice question. Very um, not not too many people pick up on that. So that that was uh, uh, interesting. Let's see what else we have here in the questions. 
we have one here. Uh, from Gopinath, for example, introducing a probe to an oven, controlling the oven with a probe. Can we call it task unification? Yeah, you could. You know, the, the mistake with task unification is to say that, um, is to create what I, what I call platforms. You know, is the Swiss Army knife creative? Not really. All it is is a collection. It's a bundle. Um, and and, and Go, Gopinath, what you've described here is, is not a bundle. It's it's a nice task unification. It's using a probe, but integrating it into the oven. Uh, and there are ovens that have that. It's a very nice uh, task unification. Again, a lot of it depends how you define your closed world. And then, um, nice question here from, let's see, from Sean. Um, I was late in joining the SAT review session because I was traveling home from work at the time the session was beginning, I may have missed any discussion about the structure of the final exam. Okay, we'll be talking about the final exam. Um, it's worth 250 points, yep. Consequently, I downloaded the exam Word document template. I'll talk about the exam here in a little bit. I so, think Sean's doing all the work for us. Yeah, he's doing all the work. So can we assume they expected to pick any of the three parts yeah, and complete them as such? Okay, Sean, yeah, we'll, we'll clarify those questions. Thank you. Let's go, go ahead and finish the review of the other two techniques. Uh, the next technique is uh, division. And division is defined as taking a product or a component and dividing it physically or functionally and then rearranging it. It's cut and divide. And subtraction, I mean, sorry, division is very powerful to break one of the types of fixedness in particular called structural fixedness. Uh, to use division, you follow these steps. You list the product's internal components. Here again, the components on the product or on the, on the service within the closed world. And then you pick one component and divide it out either physically, functionally, or what's called preserving. There are essentially three ways to do division. Functional division is you just take the function of the component and put it somewhere else. Physical division is imagine cutting it with a, with a hacksaw and you rearrange it somewhere else. Preserving is the, is the oddball one. It confuses people. All preserving is is cutting it down into little versions of itself. Think cupcakes or Philadelphia cream cheese single serve. Those would be examples of preserving division. And boy, it's powerful. I mean, it can really yield some interesting uh, innovations when you take the larger product and just make it simple, single versions of itself. Um, that becomes the virtual product. Function follows form. Should we do it? Can we do it? Modify the new product to improve it. Now, um, and a question from Sean here. Sean, good good call out. He's he's wondering why we didn't go in depth on multiplication. Can we add a bit more about how to think about the multiplication process? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll go back on that one in just a minute. Thanks, Sean. So the division is a particularly useful product or a technique when you have a, um, a product or especially a service innovation, a process, but it works equally well. You know, never think that the, any of the techniques won't work on a, a product or a service, they will. But when I'm dealing with a service or a process, I generally start with division. Now the hard part to using division is two things. One is how you rearrange it. When I rearrange something, I just do it randomly. I put it somewhere else back in the closed world. The wilder, the better. Because that's going to break fixedness. And I see Jason smiling because he's he's been there on this one. With, 
Yeah, I think I always, um, the thing that breaks through for me too is moving it in space and time. And the tip I would yeah. have for you, if you're doing a service, write the steps out on a post-it note, grab one, close your eyes and, and see where it lands. And typically the more random you are, the wilder you get, the better idea. So rearrange in space and in time. You can do both vectors and, and go wild with it. And, and so that was the second thing that I, I was going to mention that, that gets people confused. How you rearrange can be both a physical location. In other words, you put the component somewhere else, somewhere wild, and or you put it at a different time of time period. It's still in its original place, but now it's been divided out and shows up at a different time. That can yield some crazy things. Now, division, I got to warn you, Division is the one that blew my mind the most. It was the hardest for me to learn, but now it's, I'm, I'm telling you, it's incredibly powerful. Um, to Jason's point, you really do want something wild. In fact, you'll many times get a rearrangement that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It tr truly will make you laugh or make you <laughs> throw up. I'm not sure which, but you look at it and go, well, that's, you can't do that. You know, that's impossible. Remember, when you say something like, it's impossible, you just answered the second question first. You just said, can we do it? No, it's impossible. You always start with, should we do it? Think of SIT as a benefit discovery vehicle, right? It's a way to discover benefits you wouldn't have seen otherwise. Um, and then you modify the new product to improve it. So examples of, of division, I'm going to show you some examples of these all in a minute. But this, this one, is, as uh, Jason pointed out, many times we'll do this on post-it notes. Now, in the final exam, uh, you know, the, the, if you're using the app, which is one class is using the app, it'll do the rearrangement for you, which is, which is really nice. But if you're not using the app, then you want to do it on post-it notes or somewhere where you can visually imagine it being somewhere else. It, it really is a fun technique once you... Once you trust it and kind of let it <laughs> go with it, let it do its job. So uh, good question here from Jay, JL. Uh, can you by chance give an examples of functional and physical division? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a functional division would be taking its a function and putting it somewhere else. So if you take the function of checking in for an airline, normally that was done at the airport ticket counter. That function now has been divided out and placed in your home, that function. Um, the, the ticket counter isn't in your home. The ticket counter is still at the airport. But the function of that ticket counter has been placed in your home. You check in now. That's an example of functional di uh, division. Physical division is when you cut the component and put it somewhere else. Typically, its function comes with it, and that's sometimes where, Jay, where the confusion is with functional versus physical. Um, a remote control, you know, is that a functional division? Well, yeah, you've divided out the function and placed it in a handheld device, but you've also physically divided the controls out and placed it somewhere else, too. I think a great example of division, especially one that demonstrates Jason's point about time versus space division, is a drone. If you look at, at a, like a military drone, for example, the pilot has been divided off and placed where? On the ground or on another airplane. But if you look at that as a, as a division through space, and location, you could and say the pilot is now in a different location, but there's another version of drone that is division through time, where the pilot pre-programs the flight mission into the drone, and they only the pilot only sort of shows up when the flight plan is is uh, executed. So drone is a great example of a, a division through space or time. Part of your final exam, by the way, is going to be looking at a smartphone and finding all five examples 
of the, these techniques, it's really simple, <laughs> guys and gals, really simple. Um, and it's something that um, I want you to start to pattern spot. You know, Jace, Jason can validate this too. Pattern spotting is your ability to see inventions around you and be able to figure out what, um, you know, what uh, tool was used. Uh, so Liam's got a good example here. An example of division by time might be Mars um, rover, the latency delay between NASA controllers and the rover executing the controls of a few minutes. Um, you know, I'm having a little trouble with that one, Liam. You know, we may have to go offline with that. I'm not seeing it. I think that latency is is kind of a... It's a, it's a factor. It'd be nice if you could divide that out and place it somewhere else. Like imagine if you can accumulate all the latencies in, a, in, a, in some other vessel and do something with them. Um, you're out there, man. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty trippy, the, the Mars latency. Let's go back and answer the questions about um, multiplication because... Um, I think Sean brought this question up about multiplication. We didn't go it, through it as in depth as we could have. So, so Sean, um, a good example of multiplication: if you are dealing with something with a, just a few components or many components, it doesn't matter. But especially something with with very very simple uh, architecture to it, like this pen, multiplication works great because it just it's going to give you more degrees of freedom. The key to multiplication is pick a component randomly, make a copy, but change it in some random way. Another clever way to boost up, the, to amp up, to juice up the effect of multiplication is to make multiple copies. Two, six, 25 and a half. Let your mind make up something that does exactly what I see Jason doing, kind of smiling. It's like, that's weird, right? Yeah, make as yeah. many as you want. I, uh, and they can be simple, to Drew's point, right? Having multiple shower heads with different patterns is multiplication. Having a hose with different nozzles that spray differently is multiplication. But go anywhere from one copy to you could go to 500. Because when you go to 500, that's going to take your mind to a different place and a different um, virtual product and break some of that fixedness that's so ingrained within us all. Okay. Uh, so let's go on to the last technique. I've got a few minutes left. This one is by far the most difficult to, to learn, the most difficult to, to teach. I've emphasized that uh, numerous times. Let me um, get it. Let me get it up here. Um, attribute dependency. Here is the biggest mistake made on this final exam. The biggest mistake made on this final exam is confusing components with attributes. I, um, I'm amazed at how often I will go around and see students making this mistake um, and I pointed out to them, I said, look, you're making this mistake right now, and they still don't get it. So, so what is a component and what is an attribute? A component of this pen, a component of this pen would be the clip. An attribute of this pen would be the length of the clip. An attribute is a characteristic, something that can change. The length can get longer, wider. So a component is sort of static. It's fixed. An attribute is variable. It can change. Attribute dependency is the... Use, Drew, is um, components tend to be nouns. They're things. Yes. An attribute is often described or usually as an adjective, right? I love that. Color, it's long, it's short, it's on, it's off, uh, it's round, it's square. So components 
typically nouns, attributes, it's a descriptor, it's an adjective. I, I love that. That's a, it's really a great uh, way to think about the difference between the two. Attribute dependency, as the name implies, uses attributes, not components. Now, a lot of times to figure out the attributes, you got you got to look at the components to figure out what attributes of the components. I get that, but don't when you when you do your final exam, don't list the components. List the attributes of components, attributes of the product. Um, yeah, Lauren, that was helpful. Thanks. And and so here's the here's the twist with um, attribute dependency. Let me go back up on screen here. You list the internal and external variables or attributes. Remember, variables, the word variables and attributes are interchangeable. Internal attributes are the things directly attached to the device, like the pen. External variables are the things directly around the pen in the closed world. The size of the hand the the purpose for writing the type of paper that's being written on right those are things not related to the pen but in in its immediate vicinity that's where the gold happens that's where the the cleverness happens with attribute dependency you take an internal attribute an external attribute and create this correlation. If you remember this phrase, you will be okay with attribute dependency. That phrase goes like this. As one thing changes, another thing changes. When you create your virtual product, if you just remember that phrase coming out of your mouth, as one thing changes, another thing changes, and you can put it in that phrase, for example, as the size of the hand changes, the color of the clip changes. That would be the virtual product. Now, that's all I do. I create that phrase. That's the virtual product. Then I go to function follows form. What would be the benefit? I don't know, Jason, can you think of anything? Why would the, the, the color of the clip change with the size of the hand? Putting you on the spot, Jason Dudley. Come on, let's see if you can do it. I, uh, I got distracted by Chase's question down there. Um, color of the clip and the size of the hand. As the size of the hand changes, the color of the clip changes. Okay, so you have different um, clips for different... If you're sizing for a kid's baseball club, it helps you get the... It helps you identify and okay. does a new job of finding the right glove. So it becomes sort of some sort of sizing, some sort of information element. Good. You gotta get the blue glove, the red glove, the green glove. <laughs> okay. I do want to get to um to Chase's question in a minute. Though. Okay, let's see what he has here. I think no. there's a bit of confusion on, yeah. and I, and this happens a lot. So totally normal as you're learning it. Internal is not component. It components and attributes can be internal or external. So internal is just the product you're setting, and external is the closed world around it. So in both of these cases, they're internal attributes, the product you're focusing on, and external attributes, the things that surround it. So in Drew's example, the internal attribute was the color of the pen clip, and the external, because it's not the product, it's surrounding it, is the size of the hand. Yeah, so so this is a an important distinction because um, Chase... Components can be both external and internal. Attributes can be both internal and external. But components and attributes are completely different. External generally means it's not in your control as the manufacturer. Uh, but it's still there. Okay. The mistakes people make with... Um, I'm sorry, let me get off the screen here. The mistakes people make with... Um, Attribute dependency, the tough part is distinction between attributes and components. And the second thing is 
generally you want to start with the external attribute changing and the internal attribute changes in response to it. It doesn't have to be, but that's typically how I like to think of it. As the external attribute changes, the internal attribute changes. Another version, another version is as an internal attribute changes, another internal attribute changes. So you can pair up internal to internal. You can't pair up external to external. If you do that, you'll get the deducted points deducted for envisioning something that um, <laughs> truly can't be done. Uh, okay, question here from Claire. I believe we described it in class as internal things the manufacturer can control and external things the consumer controls. Another nice way to put it. The external things are the, cons the consumers are kind of in charge of that. Yeah. You know, it's part of their body, part of their activities, part of their mindset, whatever. Good. Nice. Very nice. Okay. Uh, let's go and just wanted to share some examples of uh, these techniques. Um, these are examples that I generally share with clients. If you look at multiplication, for example, a very nice example is a company like Airbus makes military aircraft. And what they do a lot of times is they'll make, they'll, they'll use the multiplication tool to, to innovate how they load cargo. So they'll imagine different cargo pallets at different locations, creating different copies of them. Very, very uh, clever and simple examples of multiplication. Multiplication is kind of the sleeper. You know, it's probably the easiest one to use, but you'd be surprised how little multiplication can create some dynamite ideas. So don't look at it as just, um, a, you know, too simplistic. Not at all. Um, division technique. This is an example from a company that makes hoses, right? Just everyday hoses. And what they did is they imagine dividing a hose down its length. Um, so you have a hose, but now you only have half of a hose. Looking down its length, you only see half. And one of the obvious benefits, you know, it's got to lay flat and things like that. But the real benefit is a D-shaped hose, a hose that's in half like that won't kink. It won't bend and, and uh, cut off the circulation. Just a brilliant idea. These are real examples from real clients. Attribute dependency. This one's used a lot by my pharmaceutical clients. In this case, Bayer Pharmaceutical. They make contrast elements, contrast agents for MRIs. So they, they'll put a contrast agent in your bloodstream and then uh, do a CAT scan or MRI and then see that contrast agent and what they're starting to do now is create different contrast agents for different age of patients. So an 11-year-old child gets a slightly different contrast agent than a 60-year-old adult. And they're creating variations of their contrast agents and getting really, really great, great products uh, as a result. Uh, quick question here from Liam to get a little more general. Are there any other common pitfalls or missteps that either of you would recommend we watch out for during the exam? Um, yeah. I can start with one, Drew. Sure. I've seen it a lot. I think you get into an exam and you want to get the whole thing done quickly, right? And what's the first step? It's your component list. And so one of the biggest pitfalls I see is people make a component list. They rush through it. And then they get stuck on the tools, so they take longer and longer, um, and it limits their ideas. I mean, you've, you've heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out, right? So right. I encourage everybody to take time to get their component list right. And once you move to the first tool, you can still step back. Remember, you can zoom in or out on components. So don't feel like, I've made my component list. It's set in stone. It can never change. You don't want to create swirl and you know go in with a 1,000 components off the bat, but I had a student once, I think, that went so macro, they only picked three components, and it really limited their ability to um, use the tools. Yeah, so so let me add on to that. 
and this is the good one, a really good rule of thumb for this final exam and beyond. You know, I mean, the, the exam, folks, is just one event, right? I want you to use the techniques correctly for the rest of your life. If you're struggling with using the method, most likely you have a closed world problem. You haven't defined your closed world or you haven't defined it tightly enough. As Jason said, you know, it's too macro. So you need to zoom down. Let's do an example. If you're innovating a blender in the kitchen, you could define the, the closed world as the whole house. Chances are you're going to struggle. You need to zoom down to the kitchen, the kitchen countertop, the blender itself, or even one component of the blender and list all its components. Remember, zoom in or zoom out. The closed world, you can dial it in, dial it out. It's like a camera lens, right? It's looking, and as you change the zoom on the lens, you see different components. The exact same thing. If you're struggling on this final exam, before you call 1-800-DREW or 1-800-JASON, <laughs> which I'm, I'm happy to take your call, um, before you call us, you change the closed world. Change it up. Most likely you've got something amiss there or it's going to give you a different look and just start over. And uh, that that is the... Anytime I hear somebody struggling, a team, an individual... Myself, I changed the closed world. Okay, uh, I think, let me see, did I have one other example? Yeah, here's, a, I mean, this is an exa t another task unification example, and then we'll wrap up here. The task unification, this one is was a, a, one of my clients, Eli Lilly. They use task unification in a very clever way with social media apps. What they did is they created a list of the selling process, the sales process um, of a sales rep, a typical drug sales rep. And let's say it had 20 steps. What they did is they matched social media apps with steps of the selling process to create bizarre virtual products. And in doing so, they, they really were able to break through the right way to use social media with their sales process. What they did is the creative act. It's taking any two disparate things, two things that don't belong together, and mashing them together. Uh, Stephen Jobs, you know, he, he's his fame. One of his famous quotes. I'm not a big Stephen Jobs fan, but one of his my favorite quotes of his is, "Creativity is just connecting things." You can't say it any simpler than that. It really is just connecting things and then seeing that, well, what he left off. It's connecting things then see, seeing if there's any value. All right. Um, all right. So would you suggest changing the closed world on every method? Maybe. Not necessarily. You don't have to. If you're getting the ideas flowing, great. But if you're stuck change up the closed world. Give yourself a fresh look at a new component list. And then we have a question here from ICE. Uh, what ha what's happening if we don't do well on the exam? Um, we, um, if you don't do well on the final exam, we will uh, banish you from ever stepping in another Starbucks for the rest of your life. No, I'm kidding. That would be harsh. Um, you're not going to do poorly on this final exam. Um, students do well on this exam. I only had one student that had a real blowout, and she was just in a really good student, but just was just not not getting it. You know, she just put herself into a real tizzy. And I just said, "Hey, just stop and um, let's come back the next day. Try it again. It's a take-home exam anyway." But I, I, I think if you are stuck and that really stuck, you call one of us and let us just talk you off the ledge because th this is not this is not hard, but it has to be done correctly. Be true to the process. How many times have you heard us say, be true to the process. Let the tool do the job it's meant to do. You get the fun part. You get the part of discovering um, 
you know, the, the interesting stuff. Okay, it's been a rough day. <laughs> I see, don't worry, you'll get through it. Okay, so the exam isn't timed, correct? We really have the whole week to complete the pieces. Josh, that's correct. The final exam is, uh, Claire, the final exam should be on uh, Canvas. I'll go in there after we're done and make sure that it's opened up. Uh, if you can't find it, just drop me a, an email or to Darla, and we'll get it open up for you. Okay, uh, we're, we are going to adjourn. Um, thank you for joining us tonight, and thank you for hitting that subscribe button and, the <laughs> and that like, thumb, thumbs up. Um, and to, let's see, where is the questions from Antoinette? Okay, just one more question here. Okay, Claire, I'll find it for you. On the final exam, is it okay to combine some of the techniques or do you need to be in? So Antoinette, it's very common to combine techniques. On this exam, I'd like to see you do one idea per technique. Um, now, that said, if you, if you can bring in another variation to give yourself an even better idea, great. Hey, you know, have some fun with this too. Don't, don't stress out about this. Have some fun. Use this as an example to build your um, your your skills with this you know this important technique. Uh, okay, I don't see it on Canvas. Okay, what is Darla's email? Claire, her email is darla at drewboyd.com. Um, I'd like to get an answer to Sean's question before. Okay, I'm I'm looking for those. And where are Sean's questions here? Sean, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Sean's questions right now and um, send out a, a broadcast email on all of it, okay? So let me go ahead and I'll copy these and, um, and get these to where uh, I can, I'll email the entire class on these answers. So, because I see his answers about the point totals, and um, if there's something messed up here, we'll we'll go ahead and fix it, folks. Don't worry about the point totals as much, right? You're you're look at the 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 bigger part of this is to get clear about um, using the techniques correctly, letting them lead you to some really good ideas. But I will go ahead and get uh, answers to Sean's question that um, about the parts and the points. Okay. All right. Any other, Melissa, thank you for the review. Good. Thanks for joining us. Um, Sean, yeah. Parts A, B, and C. Oh, yes. You're doing all three parts. Correct. Claire, thank you for the review. Okay. Thanks everybody. Uh, appreciate you being part of this first live stream. Uh, and thank you again for subscribing. Jason, thanks for helping out during this course and being part of our review tonight. Uh, stay in touch. If you have any questions about this or any problems, make sure you get in touch with one of us right away. Great to join. Stay in touch. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.